Hey guys, welcome back. So today I received a package in the mail from California. A subscriber named Lewis sent me his generator to take a look at. And as you can imagine, it does have issues. So let's get it out of the box and see if it survived the trip. He sent me his Honda EM500 generator. It is a tiny little generator. It only produces about 400 watts and it's pretty beat up. You can tell just by looking at it. Now, a lot of this damage actually happened back in the early 80s. He was parked near some train tracks. A pickup truck drove by, hit the tracks and this thing flew out of the back of the pickup and rolled down the side of the road like a bowling ball. So yeah, it's had a tough life. I think he's used it quite a bit over the last 40 years and has never had an issue with it until recently. The 120 volt outlet started outputting 180 volts. So most likely the AVR is bad and I'm hoping that it's not because it is proprietary, it's discontinued and currently there's none available on the used market. And even if there was, they sell for about $200. So I'm not in a huge rush to just throw parts at it unless I know it needs that part. Now, I think the oil was drained for shipping, but I'm not so sure. I'm seeing signs of oil down in the air box. There's some dripping down here, and I also see some oil right here. So I say we check the oil. If that looks good, we'll add some gas, try starting it, and just validate where this machine is at. Yeah, it looks like the oil was drained or maybe it all leaked out. Not sure, but regardless, we do need to add some oil. So I'm going to top that off and I think I'm going to get the tins off, get the air box off. Just take a look where all this oil is coming from. Doesn't take much oil, only 350 milliliters. Nope. It doesn't look too bad in here. I mean, there's not like a bunch of oil puddled anywhere. Uh, the air filter is 
saturated though, so I'm gonna squeeze that excess out. Uh, the tank actually is held in by the skins. So I might need to put this one back on just to kind of keep it in place. The filters though, actually in very good shape. These disintegrate after about 10, maybe 15 years. So this has definitely been maintained. And I'm guessing this excess oil is just whatever was left in the engine when it was shipped. So there could also be some in the carb. I guess we won't know till we try to start it. So what kind of condition you think the tank's in? This is at least a 40-year-old machine. And it looks absolutely spotless in there. No rust, no bits of junk. So let's add some gas and I think we'll be ready to give this thing a try. Let's turn the fuel on, the ignition on. I don't see any choke, so most likely it's an automatic choke. I've got the kilowatt connected, the light turned on. Now these things are not gonna like 180 volts too much, but let's get it started and see what we get. Nothing. So let's help it out a little. I have a feeling there's oil in the carb based on how much was in the air filter and that might be preventing this from starting. So we might have to go through the carb before it'll run on its own. trying. Let's try a little more. Actually, the voltage is low. 66 hertz, 85 volts. So let's bring the engine speed down a little bit and see what happens to that voltage.
Okay, not too bad. It stayed running on its own and the voltage was actually low in the engine speed high. So I went to adjust the engine speed and then noticed the voltage had come up quite a bit, close to 200 volts. So yeah, there is something going on. We're also getting a lot of smoke from the exhaust. I'm hoping that's just a bit of oil burning off. So I'm gonna get it restarted. You know, this time I'm gonna check the DC output and see what that voltage is at. All right, let's see if this restarts. No more smoke. Okay, good. That engine started right up. It sounds great and it's no longer smoking. Plus, we have DC output. It's high at about 24 volts. So I think we are looking at an issue with the AVR, unfortunately. So I'm gonna start peeling some more layers. I wanna locate that AVR, see if there's any obvious sign of a problem and go from there. So I've been looking around and I think I see what looks to be a little AVR. It's hard to tell, but there are a bunch of wires going in and out. And I would expect the AVR is gonna need about six wires. We have, or we should have power in from the excitation winding. We should have power out to the brushes, or in this case, it's brushless. So there is a separate coil for that. That should be DC out. And then two more wires to monitor the voltage. Now, if we're really lucky, one of these is damaged or unplugged. And I do see a wire hanging out here in space. Let me take a minute and just study these wires. But this right here looks very suspicious, like there should be a wire plugged in. Yeah, I think I was wrong about what this module is. From tracing the wires, I see one goes up to the ignition switch. There's another wire that runs along here and goes to the coil. So I actually think that is the CDI. And on the other side here, it's really deep in there and hard to see, but I think that is the AVR. So the only way I'm going to get access to it is by getting these bolts out and getting this panel out of the way. All these bolts on this side are pretty loose, so someone's definitely been in over here. Graceful. And that's the AVR right there. I was really hoping to see something obvious here, but I don't. Things look pretty good. The terminals, they're not corroded. And the wires going in look to be in very good shape. There's no signs of heat. So, yeah, no smoking gun, but I'm willing to bet a new AVR would fix this problem if I can locate one. But since I can't at the moment, I think 
The best course of action is to locate a service manual. See if there's any tests I can do on the AVR or these windings coming in to the AVR. It's been a few days and I haven't got my hands yet on a service manual, but I did find a wiring diagram that gives a lot of good information. Unfortunately, no schematic on the AVR, but I have all the wires, the wire colors and what they do. So based on that, I can do some testing just to do a reality check on what's going on here. You know, that said, I am almost 100% certain we just need a new one of these. And to that end, I actually found two of them, new old stock being sold by someone in the Netherlands. And they're not cheap. I think it's about 172 euro. If I want to fix this, that is the way to go. And, you know, unfortunately, the condition of this generator isn't great. So most likely the part probably exceeds the value of the generator by a bit. But the alternative really is to throw this away or potentially fit it with a universal AVR. Even that's not practical. I'll go over that in a minute. But I think the biggest showstopper is the physical size. The universal AVR. It's about four to six inches long by about four inches tall, which is huge. There's absolutely no way to get that in this space. And I could rig something up external that I think would just be dangerous. Plus, there's a few requirements on the generator to make that work. And they're usually used for much bigger generators. So I don't know if this one's going to meet all those requirements, but that's something I'm going to check in a second. Let's just check the resistance of these windings. We'll check them to ground. Granted, I'm not fully isolated, so we might get some erroneous results, but let's start with the excitation winding. It is the yellow wires. And on most generators, I get 1.5 ohms, plus or minus half an ohm. This generator, I don't know what it will come in at, but let's see what we get. And we're at 1.2 ohms, seems perfectly reasonable. Check it to ground, no connections to ground. So that is good. Uh, next we can check the excitation in the stator, which is a winding that basically supplies power to the rotor. And we have a white and a black wire for that. Now, most rotors come in between 40 and 70 ohms. Some come in as low as eight or anywhere in between. So let's see where this one's at. And that's actually one of the dependencies on the universal AVR. The resistance has to be between 15 and 100 ohms. And in this case, we're at 24. So that is a good sign. Next, we'll check the exact, actually the sense winding, which is a subset of the main winding. We have a couple taps here. The first three have to do with the DC output. This bottom one is just a fraction of the main one, and that is the sense winding. So the generator is putting out 120 volts. The sense might be putting out quite a bit less, somewhere around 20 volts. So that one is LG and BI, which is, where is it? LG, BI, light green. And I actually don't see BI. Let's double check this. Oh, LG and L. So that's blue and green. So on most generators, the main winding is about 0 0.3, 0 0.4 ohms. I checked an EX1000 recently. The main stator came in at around 3 ohms. So since this is a fraction of that, I would expect it to be somewhere around 0.5. I think it's the bottom two connections here. Nope. And we're at 0.6, seems reasonable. Check it to ground. So yeah, no smoking guns, everything looks good here. 
Let's check the main winding. The main winding colors, I believe, are red and L, which is blue. So I already looked. I know that it's these two right here. This one comes in at three ohms, which seems in the ballpark and no connection to ground. So yeah, no smoking gun here based on the ohms on the field. The universal AVR has a chance of working. I think the biggest issue to overcome is how much DC do we need to supply to the field? Because at 120 volts, those universal AVRs can only provide about 32 volts DC. So I think what I want to do is start the generator up, supply DC power, and see how much we need to provide to get to 120 volts without a load. And it needs to be less than 32 because when under load, it has to increase the voltage up to 32 volts to the field to keep running at 120 volts. And then Lastly, which I think is going to be the biggest issue with the universal AVR is that they need four to five volts residual magnetism. And most likely this doesn't have that. There's no permanent magnets that I could tell. I took a look at a picture of this rotor online. And without that, I think the residual magnetism is not going to be enough to use an AVR like that. So this I think is bad. I'm going to cut these wires off. We'll plug it in. Supply power on the black and the white, the white being positive, using a power supply. And we'll start it up. No power applied. See what the residual magnetism is. And then bring the voltage up on the field and see how much we need to get to 120 volts. I'm going to chop this right at the bottom. So there's no going back. All right, ready to go here. Now, I'm going to be the first one to admit this is not the best idea. And even if you know what you're doing, it's still not the best idea. But for the sake of science, I'm going to do it. So the setup, we'll go over real quick here. I replugged the connector in. The only two wires I've connected are the black and the white, which provide power to the field. And that's connected to this power supply, which right now is set to zero volts when I turn it on. For now, I'm just going to get the engine started. The fuel tank's removed, we have a limited fuel supply. And if I need to shut it down, I can ground it out like this, or just wait until we run out of fuel. Now, there should be no power output until I turn this on, but there will be residual magnetism. So that's what I'm looking to see as far as what that is. And then I'll turn this on, I'll slowly ramp up the voltage and monitor the output and see how many volts DC do we need to get up to 120 volts. And I think even before I do that, it would be a good idea to set the engine speed. So yeah, I think I'll get it started. I use the tachometer to set it to exactly 3600 RPM. We'll apply some voltage and see what happens.
I think the choke is stuck. Let's give it a minute to warm up a little more. That one kind of surprised me. It was putting out close to 50 volts without any power being supplied to the field. So that is a lot higher than I would have ever expected. Now granted, there was absolutely no load, but based on what I'm seeing here, actually universal AVR, I think, could potentially power this, but the power required to the field to get it to 120 volts was also very low, like in the three to four volt range. So I'm not sure actually that universal AVRs can go that low because that is really low. Anyway, I did struggle a bit with the choke. It's just powered by a bimetallic strip, so it does need to warm up before the choke turns off, and it did finally turn off. So I'm going to do one more test. I've rigged up a 20-watt load precariously on the side here. So I want to get it running again without power to the field, see what the residual magnetism is with that light in circuit, and then we'll apply the power again to the field and see how much more voltage we need to get back to 120 volts. That's pretty impressive. I really didn't expect the light to light up without powering the field, but it did. That's a 20 watt light. We had 50 volts, even up to 60 without any power to the field. And then I applied power 
similar to last time, actually less. I think we were at around five volts this time. And I think that has to do with the fact that the engine sounded to be running a little bit faster. So yeah, the voltages involved here are very low to that field. And I think that is an issue for the universal AVR because they are meant to power much larger generators in the scale of up to 100,000 watts. And obviously this is far from that. So I think I'm most likely gonna end up ordering the correct part, but let me do a little bit more research before making that decision. And with any luck, when I turn you back on, I'll have something to fix this. Actually, I'm not quite done yet. I wanna do one more test similar to last time. I'm gonna get it started, let the engine warm up, the choke open up, and then I'm gonna power the field and bring the voltage back to 120 volts. You know, this time I've added two more multimeters. The one on the left is connected to the sense, and the one on the right is connected to the excitation winding. So I just want to see what the voltages are when we bring everything up to 120 volts. That was some good information. So at 120 volts, no load, the sense winding was outputting 18 volts and the excitation winding 14 volts. So those data points you need to know as well as the ones we gathered before, especially if you're gonna to try to use a kind of non-standard AVR. You know, in this case, I'm still leaning towards the OEM AVR, but if for some reason I can't get it, then that data is needed. And as luck would have it, I was speaking to a friend across town, Dave, who owns an EM500. He had the same issue with his a couple years ago with the AVR, high voltage. He ended up paying the 170 euro to fix his generator. And that's what I'm most likely going to do. But he also bought the service manual. So I'm going to get my hands on that. I just want to double check what that manual says as far as the resistance values and any other tests I can do because before spending that much money on a part, I wanna make sure it's the right part. So yeah, let me get that manual. I'm gonna read through it and share with you anything of interest. Dave dropped off the service manual and the information I'm interested in starts at page 40 where it lists the resistance values of each of the windings. So I took those values and compared them to the ones I got earlier and things seem to be pretty good. The excitation winding, I tested at 1.1 ohms. Manual says it should be approximately 1.04 ohms. So I think we're good there. Stator, I got 24.4. Manual says 24.7. The main winding, I got 2.9. And the manual says approximately 2.82. So I think we're good. You know, I don't see anything out of line here. The manual also said that when running at 120 volts, the 
power going to the stator field should be 5.16 volts. And I saw pretty much the same thing. I put five volts in and saw we got to 120 volts. So I am, again, 100% confident we just need an AVR. So I've already placed that order. It's going to be a few weeks before it gets here. So while I'm waiting for that, I want to clean this up a bit. I also want to go through the carburetor. Although it's running the engine well, I don't know when it was last cleaned. And I also damaged the fuel line when taking the tank off. It has a little nick in it that is going to leak fuel. So that also needs to be replaced. I need to take care getting everything else apart here. These parts, they're discontinued. They're not available. And I'm kind of kicking myself for being careless with that fuel line because it was in perfect condition until I put a rip in it. And it's a formed fuel line. It's parts not available. So that could be an issue, but we'll deal with that when we get to it. As far as getting the carb off goes, it's just these two nuts. There's another one over here. And I think the whole blower housing air box just pulls off and that should free up the carb. That was pretty loose. Very loose. Yeah, it looks like there's another one down there. It's covered in a lot of dirt. I think that's uh, another one. Since the fuel line's already trashed, I'm just gonna cut it right there. It's actually kind of petrified on this side, so maybe it wasn't quite as good as I thought it was. And the governor arm should lift right off. I think the only thing we have to do now is free up the choke. There's just a little clip here, and then the carb should slide right out. Yeah, we got a slight problem here. When I slid the carb off, I heard something fall and it was actually the insulator. It is broken in three pieces and that's gonna create a huge vacuum leak. So that has to be replaced. I'm sure it's a discontinued part, but let me pause it, see if I can't find a replacement. Yeah, I took a look online. This part's not available, new or used. At least not at the moment. I did put a search on eBay, so hopefully something pops up. I did notice a seller parting out an entire EM500. He didn't list this part, but I did message him, and hopefully he has the part I need. So in the interim, I think I'm going to have to try JB welding this together. I actually don't have all the pieces, but I do have the ones that are critical to form a good seal. This little piece on the side is missing. I guess my concern is once it's back together and I torque down the carb, is it just gonna break again? And also the JB Weld, it's gonna squirt out a little bit and prevent a good seal if I don't do this right. You know, I could sand it, but 
it's going to be pretty hard in this corner to do that. So yeah, it's not looking too good for this insulator, but I say we keep going. I want to get the bad fuel line out, get this bottom tray off, and we'll clean up that carb. Looks like there's a grounding wire right there, but otherwise we are free. So let's hope for no more surprises here. Probably going to leave that gasket alone. These lines are petrified. So they need to be replaced. So we'll just take them off. This carb too. I checked online. There is absolutely nothing available for it. So hopefully we don't get any more surprises. Yeah, looks pretty good, which I guess I knew because it was running the engine well. So yeah, carbs in very good shape. I'll clean it anyway, just to make sure it's good for many more years. Uh, there are a couple more things here. It looks like this is the pilot circuit here, and this is an adjustment on the idle as far as the air fuel mixture. So let's see where that's set. I'm guessing it's set pretty rich given the condition of the insulator. It's one turn, one and a half, two, two and a quarter. So yeah, it seems a little rich. You know, I would guess the initial setting is more like one and a half. this may not come out. It looks like the idle might be in the way. So let's take that out. This is the idle set screw and this generator does not idle. So you don't need to set it back in ex exactly the right spot. You just want to get it in enough so that it doesn't fall out, but you don't want it influencing the position of the throttle plate. That was loose. Yeah, and there's a tiny little jet in there. Let's see if I can get that out. Actually, I don't think that jet comes out. I don't see a slot for a screwdriver, so we'll leave that alone. But let's try getting the main jet out. 
as well as the emulsion tube. That was in there pretty loose. There's the main jet. In the emulsion tube. So yeah, this carb's in pretty good shape. It's not really dirty to speak of. I mean, there's a little bit in the bowl, but all things considered, for a 40-year-old machine, it's in excellent condition. So yeah, I'm just going to run through everything with a wire, make sure there's nothing causing an obstruction. We'll soak this for five or 10 minutes in the ultrasonic, and this should be done. see where this main jet is sized at. We'll start with 76. That fits. About a 75. Yeah, 75 does not fit. So this is a tiny little main jet. Carb cleaned up well, and it's ready to be put back together. But before I do that, I thought I would reuse some of the Harbor Freight Super Heavy Duty Degreaser from the Ultrasonic Cleaner to help clean the base of the generator as well as the blower housing. So before actually using that cleaner, I'm going to use some WD-40, brush it in. That usually does a good job of breaking up oil. And then we'll just use the degreaser to just help wash the last bit off. All right, so let's get this back together. We'll just start with the emulsion tube in the main jet.
Put this cap back on. And just drive the auto set screw in until it starts to pop out the other side just a bit. That should be fine. And then the needle goes right there. And it was set at two and a quarter. I'm gonna bring it in a bit. We'll, we'll bring it to two. And we can always adjust it later when it's back on the machine. So turn it in until it seats. Don't apply too much force because you could damage the needle. So just lightly seat it. Which is right there. So we'll do it's one. Two turns out. So that should do it. So hopefully this works. I know it'll work. I guess the question is how long will it work? Well, that's drying. I'm gonna use a little bit of the extra JB Weld to help fill this crack that's right here. It's on both sides. You can actually see a little bit of daylight through it. It's not causing an issue now, but I'm gonna give it a little more strength so that it doesn't become an issue. I'm going to clean the engine up a little bit too. I don't want to go crazy because I don't want to get anything soaking into the stator, but I can definitely clean off the block and maybe a little bit over here.
So it's been about 48 hours. It is cured and seems to be holding. Now, I did notice an issue with this piece right here. It's not perfectly flat. It was a couple thousandths off. So I had to add a little more JB Weld, used a razor blade to kind of smooth it out and let it dry. And I've just been sanding it and getting it pretty smooth. So this side is just about done, needs a little more work. And then this side is gonna be a little more tricky. I can sand it kind of on the edges, but it's not gonna be perfect like this side. So most likely I'm gonna make up a gasket for this side and just double gasket it. And we'll try fitting it to the machine. Came out pretty well. The seams are nice and smooth. There's no sign of imperfections, at least by touch. And same on this side. So I think this piece is as good as it's gonna get. So I'm gonna make a gasket so I can double gasket this side since I couldn't sand it quite as well. So I'm gonna transfer the shape onto this gasket material. We'll have to freehand that little piece right there and we'll cut it out. pretty close. Need to shave a little bit more off the top, but I think the angle is right. Yeah, that's pretty much perfect. So I say we keep going, we'll get the carb, the blower housing back on and give it a try. See if the spacer is gonna work. Now would be a good time to get the fuel line on, but before I install the new fuel line, I wanna put a 90 degree bend on this because when it goes into the tank, it does need to be at a 90. And, you know, I could probably get away with just bending it like that, but I think I can do something a little bit more permanent just by heating up some water, holding it in there for a minute or so with a piece of copper wire or something just to hold the bend. And then when it cools down, it should 
hold its shape. It's amazing how quickly these induction stoves get up to temp. I think the only issue is most of my pans are stainless steel, which doesn't work with this type of thing. So I put a piece of copper wire in here and I'm just bending it to shape. I'm actually gonna bend it a little bit past what I need. Then we'll just soak it for about a minute. All right, let's see if this worked. Yeah. I think that's a lot better. Usually I'd bring something like this up to about 50 inch pounds. In this case, I'm gonna start at 30, given the condition of that spacer and see how the engine runs. Made it to 30, didn't hear any cracks. I topped the carburetor off with some fuel. So let's try starting it, see if there's a massive vacuum leak or if the engine runs well. Sounds good. This thing just ran for almost five minutes, 
with only the fuel I put in the bowl and this 10 inch fuel line. So that is pretty impressive. As far as the JB Weld repair goes, I would say that is a success because the engine ran without issue. Even the choke seemed to turn off faster this time. So I think we're looking pretty good. We just need the AVR and to that end, I did get a notification today that it has shipped. So with any luck, I should have it in about a week. New AVR showed up today. So let's get it installed and hopefully it works. And when I say new, it's actually new old stock. So this is an old AVR, never been used. So hopefully it's still good. All right, it's the moment of truth. Let's get the engine started and hopefully we see somewhere close to 120 volts. Perfect. We're at 121.2 volts. Not too bad. I'm glad it worked out. 200 bucks, it's a lot of money to spend on any generator. Never mind one like this that only makes 400 watts and is about 40 years old. But that said, these fetch a good amount of money. I see them on eBay in the $400 range in good condition. Granted, this one is not in great condition due to these tins. So I would say it's worth 200 bucks at best. As luck would have it, Dave, the guy across town I borrowed the service manual from recently purchased a new control panel. It was actually used and he found that on eBay, but it not only included the control panel, but it included a whole set of tins, which he did not need because his tins are in excellent condition. So he gave me those tins. They are dent free. Granted, they're not perfect, but it's a lot better than what was on there. So I say we move this control panel over and then get this stuff reinstalled and we'll do some more testing. The shutoff lever, it was held on by a piece of wire, which actually worked fine. I did, however, find the correct part that should go there. What remains of the original one is still in here. So I just need to get that out and get the new part in.
Weather's not exactly cooperating today, so we're gonna do this right here. I've got six lights ready to go. Each one is 70 watts. So if I turn them all on, that'll be 420 watts, just slightly above the 400 watt rating. So the plan is get it started, let it warm up. Before applying a load, I'm gonna double check the voltage, the Hertz. We'll take a look at the output, the sine wave, and measure the THD. This little Honda did a great job pulling the 420 watts. It did not struggle at all. The engine speed held at 60 and a half hertz and the voltage I think was close to 118 volts. And as far as the output on the oscilloscope, it did look dirty, but that is typical of brushless. So there's no surprise there. But the harmonic distortion, that one did surprise me. I expected it to be quite a bit worse than a brushed generator with an AVR, but it really wasn't. I've tested a few brushed generators with AVRs. Without a load, they start at around 7 to 9%. And at half load, the harmonic distortion goes up to about 20%. So really, this one wasn't too much different. Anyway, I'm glad I fixed this. I know it's an old machine. It doesn't make a lot of power, but it is a quality machine, and it's meant to last. It'll produce 400 watts all day long, all week long, all year long. I have no doubt of that. So I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching. All right, not quite done yet. After cutting the AVR off of this connector, I did not throw it away. I sent it to Gary. He has the proper equipment to depot boards and repair them. And my hope wasn't to repair the board. I actually wanted to reverse engineer it because these boards are basically not available. And if you can find one, they cost a ton of money. And it would be nice to have other options out there for all those people who still use and love their EM500 generators. Anyway, before depotting it, Gary tested it using the service manual and it did come back as bad. So there was no harm in attempting to depot it. And unfortunately, it required excessive heat to get the potting off. He was able to get it off at least on the back side, and you could see all the wire traces and where everything goes. So that is a big step in the right direction. Unfortunately, the heat and the potting lifted the component values off the components. So without that, it's really hard to reverse engineer this with any certainty. You know, that said, he did make a video on it. So I'll link to that up above. And he spoke about the theory of operation as far as how this works, but without a schematic and the component values, reverse engineering this is gonna be very difficult. So I'm putting a call out 
to anyone at Honda Power Sports who happens to be watching this, who has leverage there, because this is an obsolete component. It's 40 years old. And without replacements, there's going to be a lot of these EM500s going to the landfill. And yeah, it's only 400 watts. But you can do a lot with 400 watts. Plus, there's really no reason to not share this information at this point, whether it be the schematic or licensing out the schematic to someone else to manufacture some of these. So if you are that person that has that access or you know someone who does, please reach out to them, show them this video, and have them contact me. I would like to get some of these boards made up if possible. Anyway, now I'm done.